Hello, hello. Hello, thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us for our PR Career Readiness chapter meeting. It's our first chapter meeting of the semester, which is just super exciting. Um, so Kristen, I know you well. I've had Dr. Howes, Professor Thompson. I'm not quite sure who you are yet. So it's really nice yeah. to meet you. Um, yeah, so this is going to be an awesome session. I know uh, Dr. House is having some difficulty getting into the Zoom, so why don't we go ahead and just kick it off um, with who you are, what you do, and yeah, maybe Professor Thompson, since uh, I don't know who you are yet, uh, why don't you go ahead and start and introduce yourself? Well, Lauren, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, as you mentioned, I am Professor Christopher Thompson. Um, I do teach there in the program. So I teach PR cases and PR uh, principles. Um, I've been teaching since the fall. Uh, this is my first year at KSU. Typically, uh, I have taught graduate level uh, strategic communications at Columbia University, but excited to join the OWLs. Um, my background in, in PR and comms uh, started in corporate communications and, and uh, Viacom, CBS, you all may have heard of MTV, uh, MTV, BT, those networks. Um, and then uh, I moved to Atlanta uh, where I started working in uh, corporate communications and corporate social responsibility for Turner Broadcasting. Uh, and then had a pit stop over at Delta Airlines where I worked in pilot communications. Um, I have my master's for, in strategic communications from Columbia University, um, and I'm just excited to really um, be here tonight. Um, I also am owner of my own um, PR firm, uh, House of Heroes PR, where we do multicultural marketing uh, and experiential uh, events. That's fantastic. Awesome. So I have to say, I'm a senior in my last semester, Professor Thompson, but I think you and I would have been good pals, a good student professor relationship. And I can confidently say that there are definitely students in this room who have been totally inspired by you. So thank you so much for everything that you do. We're happy to have you as an owl here. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, Kristen, let's kick it over to you. I know you well, so why don't you tell everyone else who you are? Yeah, again, thank you so much for having me. I definitely love this chapter. I think Kennesaw PRSSA is one of those chapters here in Georgia that's close to my heart. Um, I am from Alabama originally, but I've become a Georgia native over seven years ago now. Um, so I went to the University of Alabama and was super involved in the PRSSA chapter there. And as soon as I moved here, right after graduation, I got involved with PRSA Georgia. And through that, met Lauren and Dr. Weed and this lovely group um, and have been super fortunate to be the professor, professional advisor, not professor, for this chapter for um, going on a year and a half now, I guess. So so excited to be with you all for my day job. Um, I currently work at MSL and I've been here for a year and a half. So I am agency side. Prior to that, I was at Porter Novelli for five years and um, currently doing mostly consumer communications. So have a wide background though, across corporate communications and brand marketing and DE&I work even. Um, so I've been fortunate to have with the agency life, have my work span a lot of different industries and sectors. I like to say I've worked with everything from Fortune 500 companies to nonprofits and more, but my current clients are the Home Depot, um, also working on the nonprofit side with their foundation. And then I just started work. I'm so excited with Inspire Brands, so Arby's and Buffalo Wild Wings, so getting into that booty space. Um, and in my free time, I am a huge foodie, so that works out well for me. Love eating and drinking and dining around Atlanta. But um, yeah, so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you all so much. So um, I guess at this point, I know we're still working on getting Professor Howells into the Zoom. So we're just going to keep on going. And when she pops in, we'll redirect focus. And let's do in order of questions. Let's go Professor Thompson to Kristen. And then when Dr. Howells gets here, we'll shoot over to Dr. Howells. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, so the first question that I have for our panelists this evening is, how can emerging PR professionals overcome anxiety when going into their first year working in PR? Professor Thompson, we'll start with you. Uh, that's such a good question. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I would have to say, and maybe some of the panelists would agree, is that PR is all about 
uh, harnessing your strengths um, in the midst of the change. Um, so uh, understanding that change is something that's going to be constant, especially when you're working in PR, uh, going into it, knowing that things will change and things will uh, change at, you know, in a given dime, if you will, um, you just have to be able to adapt through those things. I would say the first step is to know that um, everyone is learning as we're going. Um, like We like to say we're building a plane in the sky as we go. Um, there's always these new uh, platforms that are popping up, new social media platforms and new uh, you know restrictions that you can and cannot do. So understanding that there will be change is, uh, I would say, number one. Uh, second, also overcoming like this perfectionist, uh, being perfectionist, um, allowing things to just happen naturally, learning, uh, I call it failing forward. Uh, so as you fail forward, you're learning how to do something right. And then uh, making sure you and your team are, you, you're learning how to document the ways that you've done something in a way that uh, wasn't successful. And then you know the right way to actually do it. Um, and then third, I would say is um, don't be don't be afraid to call on people um, and build your tribe because as you climb in the industry, you're going to need to rely on others who are subject matter experts in particular uh, business categories and industry. So uh, be sure that you're, you're nice, you're a good human, um, and you know how to reach out to other people um, as you are going into different business categories throughout your career. Yeah, that's some really great advice. So not being afraid to lean on others and knowing that things are going to change and it's it's okay to go with that change. Yeah, it's Murphy's Law. You know, things, uh, what will happen will, will definitely happen, but learning to be okay with that um, and navigate that change, absolutely. Awesome, that's such great advice. So Kristen, real quick, Dr. House is in the house, so. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what, well, I know what happened, but anyways. <laughs> We're all good. Christian to the rescue, as usual. <laughs> thank you, Christian. Um, <laughs> Dr. House, thank you so much for joining us for our PR Career Readiness Panel. So happy to have you here. Um, so we were just kind of talking about, real quick, like overcoming anxiety in the industry. But before we get to that, I would love for you to introduce yourself for the students in the room and the students on Zoom who haven't had the pleasure of having you at Kinsaw. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I'm, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, one of my first assignments when I came to Kennesaw was to be the PRSSA advisor, and I was for four years. So it's kind of coming full circle. It's kind of nice. <laughs> um, but I'll make this kind of short and sweet, at least hopefully. Um, my background is uh, well, as you know, I teach PR classes here. But my background is I got a, a I had a journalism degree. Thought I was going to be a crusading reporter. And then out of the blue, after I had my first job at a small newspaper in North Carolina, I got a call from a former professor. So here's a tip, stay in touch with your professors. And this former professor had a job opening for an entry-level PR position at a company called RJ Reynolds in Winston-Salem. And RJ Reynolds was a conglomerate that made cigarettes, but also made Oreo cookies, um, it made wine, it owned Kentucky Fried Chicken. Anyway, so I went there, it was great. I had a great experience, did a little bit of everything, um, edited the company newspaper, um, did special events, uh, did financial communication, went to New York with my boss and we set up a, a press office there. Um, so it was great. Then I went to Coca-Cola and, um, and there I just had fabulous experience too. Um, I did again, corporate PR, financial PR. Um, I was group director of PR for uh, Coke's European division. And I was based in London for a couple of years, which was super cool. Um, and then I, I was director, group director of PR for Coca-Cola's North American operations, did product publicity and all that good stuff. But Last but not least, my best thing was I was the PR point person for Coke's involvement with the Olympic Games in um, Albertville, France, Barcelona, and then also helped out um, going to three other Olympic Games. So that's it. Sorry for the long one, but that's the picture. <laughs> no, that's that's awesome. That's exactly what we wanted. Thank you so much. Um, so just so you know, the order that we're going in right now for questions is Professor Thompson. Kristen Ellis and you. So we right. let's swing back to Kristen. So I'll just refresh on the question. Um, how can emerging PR professionals overcome anxiety when going into their first year of PR? 
Well, I just want to um, underscore everything that Professor Thompson said, 100% agree. I think flexibility and adaptability is key in this industry because you never know what each day might bring more than any other career probably. Um, so I think for me, when I was an emerging professional seven years ago, um, just knowing that it's okay to fake it until you make it because no one expects you to know everything coming out of college. There's no way that you would be prepared to know everything on day one. Um, so really just being a sponge, seeing the people in the office or virtual office that you admire and kind of learning from them as you go, um, realizing that with knowledge comes power. So kind of working for yourself to identify gaps that you have and putting in the work, you know, to fill those gaps yourself. So research and immersing yourself in industry trends and knowledge that you can get from publications like PRSA's strategies and tactics and those types of things, or just reading blogs on LinkedIn and that kind of thing. Um, I think it's just really important to be a sponge in your first year or two and to soak in as much of that knowledge and experience as you can. So not shying away from something because you've never done it before, but asking why and how and really just giving it a go. And then, you know, after you've done that one time, you can only get better every time from there. Um, so I think the biggest thing that maybe a lot of people get wrong is they expect that they have to be perfect right away to get that internship, to start really strong on that first day. And that is not true. I mean, you're there to learn and to be teachable and to just really ask for everything that you need to, to become great in your first couple of years. Um, so just don't be shy. I think, you know, especially working virtually, you have to work a little harder at that than you might have when you could turn around and talk to someone behind you, you know, at another desk or something. Um, but I think, you know, you have it in you to to get where you need to go. So just not being shy about faking it till you make it and then getting everything you need to help you make it to get there. That's some fantastic advice. How many of us have heard the phrase fake it till you make it, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people in here. Yeah. So thank you so much. I feel like a lot of us kind of get nervous to actually fake it till you make it, but thank you. We're all great doing it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dr. House, let's pass it on over to you. Well, I, I'm not sure I can add to what probably Chris and what she's, what you all have been saying. I mean, it's perfect. I would just tell you that um, from a standpoint of, of being a, an employer and bringing a new person on is um, they're here to help you. They are, they want to help you. PR people in general, I found, really want to support new and young professionals. So know that you're going into it with the idea that the people there want to help you. And we've all been, like you've all been saying, we've all been in your shoes and the whole idea is to help help you. And, and so don't, like you're all saying, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, that's what you want. I mean, obviously you want to be somewhat independent and show that you can do things on your own, but trust me, bosses will much rather prefer that you ask the question rather than, you know, get into any kind of a difficult situation. So don't be afraid to ask, as, as you guys have said. And um, I think the other thing you might do that's a little different, I'm trying to add to what you guys have said, because, uh, you know, they're, it's all awesome, good. And that would be is if you have an opportunity to volunteer to do something a little extra, go ahead and do that. So say if people are working late and they're working on a crunch on the project, and maybe it's not your project, but you're there and you say, well, if you need some extra help, I can hang around for a little bit longer. And I'll tell you what, it's it's kind of building those connections and shared experiences are what going to help you cultivate relationships and bond with people. And finding people who know the answers to the questions will be enormously helpful. Absolutely. Man, that's such incredible advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Howes. So moving on to the next question, um, let's go into, in your opinion, what's the biggest challenge for emerging PR professionals going into the industry? Because it sounds like some newcomer anxiety may be a common thing, but what's the biggest challenge that you found emerging PR professionals run into? So maybe Professor Thompson, if you're all right with starting that one off. Sure. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is um, imposter syndrome. Um, I think we all deal with this, even if it's like first day jitters, um, as, as everyone has said, Kristen said so eloquently, um, knowing that you don't know everything um, and, and, and being comfortable knowing what you 
learning what you don't know, uh, recognizing that is it puts you in a, in a humble stance. Um, it kind of changes your positioning. Um, and acknowledging that uh, there is still more to, to, to learn um, is typically the challenge because again we we live in a in a society where it's always I I have an opinion I want to I want to be up next and I have something else to add and I think just under sitting back and learning how to listen um, can be a challenge because we we're sharing our thoughts on social media and we're sharing our thoughts online so much we we I tell my classes all the time we you will always hear consumers and stakeholders express their disdain on social media, right? They just go to Facebook and they go to LinkedIn and they go to these places and they just, they harp about things. And um, understanding that you are in a position, if you learn to harness your power as a practitioner of listening, um, learn the art of listening, it'll take you so much, uh, so, so, so much further than you could with you kind of being in a stance of, oh, I have something to uh, opinion to add. Um, listening is 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 really critical and it's very hard the, the the better the better you get at your job listening become i feel listening becomes harder because you get in your way there's like this expert bias there where you like ah but ah but sometimes just listening and taking a step back and uh there's there's nonverbal communication that you can pick up on the things that they're not saying, um, and it can really uh, come to your to come to your rescue in those times when you're dealing with difficult clients. I think um, again, just learning the art of listening and not allowing yourself to uh, self sabotage yourself because you you feel that you need to know everything. Just allowing again, allowing the process to to, to unfold. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like what Kristen's saying. In your first year, you're a sponge. So yeah, I mean, probably listening does more than inserting opinions. So awesome. Okay, Kristen, over to you. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, as someone who does work with a lot of emerging young professionals and our interns and new hires, um, something unique that I have noticed in the last two and a half years, I guess, since the pandemic in 2020, so many people are starting virtually. We have this hybrid world now where, you know, 50-50 shot or more that you might have your first day from your bedroom like I did when I switched jobs a year and a half ago at the desk. And so that is a unique challenge for people who are just starting out because you don't have the benefit of being that sponge in the same way that you used to. Um, and so for me, like I had five years at a job prior to switching. And so it was a little bit easier to start, you know, my first day at a new job from home. But I've noticed the people I work with, I just think they have so much further to go because of that. They're starting out, you know, remotely. They may even be in a different city from their colleagues. Um, so I think that is a unique challenge and one that like as an industry, we need to do a better job of solving something I'm pushing my agency to kind of reconsider. And we did a really good job recently. We actually flew all of our junior staff into New York for two days of like consolidated, just like learning and training together and sitting next to each other. And it was some of the people's first time they've done that in like a year of working for the company or two. Um, so I think we have to be more intentional about providing those opportunities. So we have a couple people out of our Atlanta office. Maybe we fly them in, you know, once every few months so we can all sit together and just like see each other working and ask those questions and have that collaboration. Um, that for that I definitely like am kept up at night by this sometimes just because I'm like, we have to figure it out. Um, people need to have those same opportunities that I was fortunate to have when I was an intern or, you know, entry level. And I think we've got to find a way to bridge that gap for companies that are still largely hybrid or virtual. The biggest tip I would say that you can take it into your own hands and try to counteract that a little is just being really resourceful again. So, you know, we do a lot of like screen sharing. Like if I was sitting next to you, I would show you on my computer how I'm doing this, but I'm happy to set up a Teams chat and share my screen and, you know, just kind of do that. Um, and a lot of our junior staff is great about doing that with one another to find more efficient ways of working, answer questions um, and setting up brainstorms virtually and that sort of thing. So. I think there's a lot that we can do. And I would just say, as you are going into the industry as an emerging professional, do not be afraid to ask because there will be times where I might forget about someone who just started a year ago from home. 
And they were like, oh, it would be really helpful if you could do this for me, or if we could approach this in this way, because if we were sitting next to each other in the office, I could just ask you, and can I set up a meeting? And, you know, just ask for those things that you need. Once again, like do what you can to try to counteract that. Um, because I think there's a lot of in-person counter uh, or collaboration that's missing these days um, without having that element consistently. So try to create that for yourself um, wherever you can, if you're missing it. Yeah, that's that's incredible advice. I, I've got to say, I don't know how many of you have started an internship or a job pretty much right out the gates online, but I did. So that's, that's good. Um, those are great tips. Thank you so much. Um, okay, Dr. House, what's the biggest wow, challenge? I mean, I, I have to echo that the whole concept of uh, the virtual world is, you know, it's certainly new to me and it's not part of my experience, obviously, but I can really see how that is, um, that is, could be a real hurdle. So I'm going to just sort of add, come at it a little bit differently, because I think you guys have covered the ground uh, very, very well. And that would be, um, Try to get to know the how the organization or company that you're working with, if, and if you have clients, understand how they work, understand their structure, get to know a little bit about how they operate. If it's a company, um, you know, dig into the website, find out how they make money, how do they operate. If it's a nonprofit, how do they get volunteers? How do they raise funds? Uh, because we we try to give you some of the tools in class, but and and obviously I will say another challenge is realizing that the real world is not anything like what we can do for you in classrooms, and you're going to really learn then. But that added step of getting to know know how your clients operate will give you a perspective and help you understand their goals, their objectives, and making sure that what you propose in terms of your communication strategies are in alignment with that. So that's something different that people may not realize as a kind of an added thing to take into account. Broaden your base, broaden your knowledge about the organization. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, I virtual world definitely has changed a lot. So thank you guys so much for uh, awesome, awesome advice. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. This is a little more personal, a little less broad. <laughs> was there a particular moment in your life where you realized PR was for you? This is a good question, um, but it's also very, very personal. Um, well, I grew up knowing that I wanted to work in media. Um, I, I, I had no real idea of where I kind of fit. I had someone in my family, um, my great uncle, who was actually like, he was an anchor uh, in my town. So he um, he, he, he would always come on the news a, in the afternoon and we would sit and look at them with my grandparents. I'm just like, well, you could do that. And I was like, ah, oh, I don't, I don't think I want to go on the broadcast side. I'm not someone who's like in front of the camera. I'm more of behind the scenes. Um, and through internships, um, and, and I must say, I've heard a stat that the PR program at KSU does like the most internships and I, and it checks out because I think PR people are naturally curious. Um, but, you know, through internships, I was able to understand what, uh, you know, there was different facets of the media industry. So many, you can go into production, you can go into editing and, uh, you know, you can go on the film side, but through doing those internships and taking on those roles, um, I was able to kind of really realize that I had a knack for um, being able to uh, sympathize and empathize with individuals. Um, using that ability, uh, that was what we know today is the relationships of PR. Like we build those relationships. We're able to comb from those relationships uh, what that person is needing, uh, what that community is needing, and then being able to identify ways to bring those resources uh, or bring the information that they need to them. And um, the a story I would say is that uh, my family, we we actually are, are Hurricane Katrina uh, survivors. And so I remember when all of the lights were out, and I always tell this story, the lights were out, we had only, we only had a radio that had uh, batteries in it. And so I would sit there and I would, I would provide the news and I would think about, and I would communicate 
to people or to my family members and we would talk to them where resources were. And I think that was the moment for me where I realized being able to be in a position where I knew were resources and I could communicate to people who were in need, information that could change their life or save their life was when PR was for me. Um, I went on to, to major in, uh, in communications, um, again, with a focus on journalism, but I, through the program and through those internships, I realized that I had a knack for PR. Um, I had a knack for telling people's stories and, and, and presenting them with the best resources to make those uh, decisions for themselves. And um, storytelling was a, a big part of that. So uh, I think that was the moment that um, it just, um, I, I, I just fell in love with it and it just made sense. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. That's fantastic that you knew just from, you know, having your radio and providing the news. That's incredible. Um, Kristen, what was your experience? That's amazing. I love that story. Um, storytelling, the word kept coming up and it was for me too. I have always loved being that person to tell people stories and to find something so inspiring or motivational or inspirational and um, aspirational and just tell that. So as a kid, I would be the one when we would have, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, I would be laying out the menu graphic design was like at 12 years old or, um, you know, going around interviewing people. What was your day like? And writing books at, you know, 12 years old. So I knew I wanted to be in the media industry in some way. Um, I considered journalism as well and also considered telecommunication and film and going into the news industry. Um, I was one of those rare people I knew when I started out at the University of Alabama my first semester that I wanted to major in PR. I know it takes most people a year or two to kind of hone in on their major, um, but for some reason, PR just really stood out to me. I didn't want to be in a full face of makeup anchoring the news all day or anything, and I was like, well, I don't want to necessarily jump from job to job with journalism. PR seems like a good way to kind of have it all a little bit. Um, and I was excited about the wide variety of opportunities that PR presents from, you know, event planning to ghost writing for executives of different companies um, to being on site with a video production even. And, you know, there's so many different ways you can take it. Um, so it really, I was fortunate. It kind of just stood out to me as the major that I wanted. And um, I did a lot of kind of fact finding though that first semester and interviewed a lot of my professors. So a common theme here of, you know, what has your career been like? Like, what do you, you know, wish you had known sooner? And um, that just further kind of solidified my decision. So definitely a great one. Um, I have been really fortunate to do so many different things with PR already. And I, it's so versatile as um, a career path. So it's a great choice. Yep. Awesome. I got to say, I don't know if I, you picked up on it through the Zoom, but you got quite a bit of laughs in here from the Thanksgiving <laughs> menu. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, Dr. Howes, and what was your moment? Well, um, I kind of, it's a, it's a thread of, of experience, obviously. Uh, some of like, like Chris was talking about early days. Um, I always was a bit of a news geek because I came at this more from the journalism angle and really did not know a lot about public relations. But as a 10 year old, I was the person who created the neighborhood newspaper, went around and re reported stories and printed up the little little newspaper and, and would go around and drop off the, the neighborhood newspaper. So it was always kind of in my blood to do sort of, I guess, report the news. And, um, and, and like some of you guys have already said, it was just kind of there, telling the stories. I always like to be in the know. Um, it, it was always like, I want to be the first to know it and then tell it to other people. So that sort of took me through the journalism phase. And then, yeah, I, I, in my case, I just kind of fell into PR. It just sort of happened. I had no clue. Um, you know, I was living in an old house owned by an 87 year old lady. I couldn't even have money to buy a pair of blue jeans working on the Wake Weekly um, newspaper in Wake Forest. Um, it was great. I, I shot my own pictures. I wrote a sports column. I laid out pages. You know, I did it all. But then I got that call and I thought, well, I don't even know what this is. So I think what really kept me hooked in PR was the fact that I got to do a lot of different things. And, and ultimately that is what really appealed to me. So it was the writing. I got to, I was editor of this, you know, the employee newspaper. That was like, oh, wow, I got to do that. 
But then at the same time, we were had a groundbreaking ceremony for a new office building. And we were downtown and had ribbons and balloons. And I mean, this was fun. I mean, it was fun. And um, and then I think probably what sealed the deal was when they asked me to be the tour director for a cross-country um, musical tour uh, featuring a bunch of students from the North Carolina School of the Arts. And so um, I was on the road managing everything from dancers who were hurt to media that didn't show up to everything, you know. And I think it, it was that full circle of, hey, there's so much to do. It is not just one thing. And I think that ex early experience at R.J. Reynolds has really kind of sealed the deal for me. That's fantastic. Awesome. Okay, you guys. So getting into another somewhat personal question, not near as personal, but a little bit. Can you describe one crisis you've averted throughout your PR career? And how did you do it? What would you, what kind of advice would you give to those of us who have to avert a crisis in our future careers? Oh, gosh. Um, this is a, I don't think it's, it's fair, but uh, to talk about COVID uh, naturally, um, I think, and I, I can't wait to hear what others think as well, uh, well but dealing with COVID, um, that was my first time. Uh, I was uh, on the d internally at Delta, and I remember when we started to ground the planes, and um, we got calls, and we're just like, we just uh, we can't do it. There's there's such a um, is, there's a lots of room for error for error and risk because of things that were going on, and I think um, from just the aviation industry from as a whole, one of the things that we had to quickly think through is how do we communicate. And I talk about this in class often, but how do we communicate internally and externally to our stakeholders? The they're a loyalist of the brand, the internal, internally, our employees, right? Uh, we had to quickly think on our feet how we we're going to get the message out about what was happening next. And I think one of the things that we immediately saw is that we were a uh, aviation company and not a healthcare or a wellness company. And so being able to identify experts um, such as like the CDC and other uh, medical uh, practitioners to actually serve and anchor in our stories and in some of the storytelling we were providing to employees was something that every aviation company had to do. So there was this wasn't something just, you know, um, catered to just us, to have, how we rolled it out. I think every company found themselves we're dealing with the public. What do we do? How do we provide uh, the air of safety? How we let them know it's safe to travel, what, how to govern themselves. Um, and it got really interesting, right? And you were telling adults how to properly have manners of like how to cough and how to sneak, you know, like all those little things they had washing their hands. Like it, uh, but it really brought it home to me that uh, those things really, really matter. Um, and I would say the way that we were able to avert it um, in, in, in best way as we possibly could was finding experts um, who were experts in the space to help us identify, um, you know, how do we build in that safety um, for the consumers and for the employees uh, was, was a really hard job. It was a really hard job to do, um, but again, by bringing in those experts, we were able to successfully uh, roll out a very successful um, uh, strategy. We even brought in uh, other community partners and brands uh, like Clorox and, and so forth. Just, again, when people think of certain brands, they think of cleanliness, right? And so um, it was a idea of bringing, uh, uh, presenting the consumer with what they made them feel safe. I would say uh, being able to think strategically, uh, thinking beyond the, the right now, also thinking about when they were uh, returning back is something that I think that uh, we we had in our plan and, um, and it served to be very successful. Yeah, that's, wow. I couldn't imagine being a part of the Delta team during all of that. I, I just can't imagine. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Kristen. <laughs> Oh, that's a hard one to follow. Um, <laughs> that is, yeah, I do not envy that. You, but you all did a great job, I have to say. 
Um, so for me, when I was thinking about this question, um, I wanted to give a little smaller scale kind of small fries example, but still important. This is just a tactical kind of crisis that I faced. Um, but I think it's very useful to share. It was, it's been useful to me to learn from. Um, so I was about six months into a new job and I was responsible for end of year reporting for this big campaign and program that I had inherited kind of. Um, and so, you know, I've only really been, it's end of year, but I've only really been part of the reporting for six months. So I'm looking at, you know, data and a spreadsheet and all of the report that the whole team has put together and not super familiar with it. So catching myself up to speed with the other six months that I wasn't here for. Um, and so we deliver it to the client. We're really proud of it. We feel great about it. And um, it comes back and it turns out in the spreadsheet that kind of informs this huge report that goes all the way up to their executive leaders that there are issues with our data, basically. So some like numbers in the spreadsheet have extra zeros or like spaces in them and it's all adding up wrong. And so it doesn't sound, you know, now like a huge deal, but in the moment, of course, that definitely felt like a crisis because we're reporting year end results for this very large campaign that they've invested a lot in. Um, and so one mantra that I always tell to my teams and I try to live by is that it's PR, not ER. We are not saving lives here, um, but this is important, obviously. And so I think that, you know, I kind of developed this like three pronged approach with the team that worked really well. And anytime we've had something similar come up, it's what we've used. Um, so first of all, just acknowledging and being really transparent about any issues like this, you know, just saying, hey, like, thank you so much for flagging that. Like, we're looking into this, like we're all on the same team. Like we really wanna make sure this is right, just like you do. Like we are dedicated to making sure this gets fixed. Um, so just really acknowledging and like validating any concerns like that that may come up. We're all human, we're not computers, like errors will happen, that's life. Um, and then second of all, kind of taking time to dig into the problem, we figured out what was happening, obviously, with the zeros or the spaces. Um, so bringing in the right people to help solve it and, you know, getting the team together and then being, again, really transparent on what created this issue and the immediate steps that we're taking to solve it. So, you know, by tomorrow, like this is what we will do to implement the solution and following through on that to really instill that trust with our client. And then from there, we actually developed a long-term kind of proactive plan moving forward. We are going to have quarterly audits of the spreadsheet to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, and so it's like, I wouldn't have known that on my first day that that could be a potential issue that might come up. And stuff like that will always come up. You know, you have to, again, going back to the very beginning, be flexible and pivot and, you know, be really nimble as you go coming up with new solutions. But um, that had the potential to become a really big issue. And I think the team and I did a really, really good job of containing it and solving it and then proactively kind of solving it in the future as well by having these more regular checks so that we all could feel really confident and trustworthy about what we're reporting. Um, so again, a very tactical example, but it, it definitely was a crisis in the moment when it happened. And um, it's something I learned a lot from and I think we all did on the team, so. Awesome. Thank you for All sharing. Right, my turn. Yeah. I have to tell you, I love this question. I really love this question because it, it, it this example is a case where so much, at least in my background, was PR is so much about get your story out, you know, get publicity, get your news out, get pick up this, that, and the other. Well, this is a situation where keeping something out of the news was a major a version of averting a, a major crisis. So what happened was, this is when I was at Coke, we got a call in Atlanta from uh, our bottler, one of our bottling partners up in New York, who said, um, you know, we've got a situation here, a former employee has found, has got a lawyer and, and they're filing, they're presenting this lawsuit with us in their class action lawsuit that they're claiming that um, here at the bottling plant, we allowed blood to get into the Coca-Cola. Okay, let me tell you guys, and you can imagine two things you do not want to see in a headline together are the words Coca-Cola and blood. No, 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 no. I mean, it would, uh, you know how people think, and you know things hit social media, the general media, it would have been disaster. It would have been disastrous. So what did we do? We're like, oh my gosh, if they put this out, all they had to do was file those legal documents 
um, with the court and that then they're public record and media and anybody could get a hold of them. And we would be in a defensive mode of trying to say, no, there is no blood in Coca-Cola. Um, and uh, so what we did, this is a, a little team of us um, in Atlanta it was myself, um, a couple of, of, our, of our lawyers, as you can imagine, um, we had a product quality expert with us, a manufacturing expert. We all went up to the bottling plant and to meet with the bottlers and meet with the manager and, and walk the walk the plant and see, okay, this is where the guy says that he thinks blood got into the Coke. There was there was a, a, a incident, an accident where somebody cut their hand and there was blood and they walked across the floor perhaps of the plant and there was blood on the floor. But what we found out was that where this happened was in the area of the, the plant where the where it was all the all the all the bottling was done, it was cans going in boxes and being stacked on pallets. And the other thing is that those the cans and the bottles going through a production line are moving so fast. It's like boop, 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 boop. I mean, it's the stuff goes in into and they are just flying. There's virtually no way anybody could have like held their hand down there and drip blood in the Coca-Cola because it goes in and boom, the, the cap is on. So after talking to everybody, we felt pretty good that this did not happen because that's the first thing. You want to make sure you have your facts, right? You want to make sure if something did happen, you got to fess up and you got to be honest. So then the next thing was, okay, we are confident that this did not happen, that this guy's a disgruntled former employee. He's trying to shake us down to get some money. He found a lawyer who put together this half-baked lawsuit. But again, all they had to do was file it with the court and we would be dealing with a PR nightmare that really didn't need to happen. So on one hand, we had one lawyer who said, let him do it. We've got a case. We will squish him like a bug in court. You know, we'll take care of this. Uh, nobody will ever do this, try to do this to us again. We've got an ironclad case. Bring him on. Bring him on. I'm going, no, no, no. That is not victory. You know, victory is that this never sees the light of day, that this story never gets out anywhere because yeah, we could win in the in court, but in the court of public opinion, there would always be in the mindset of people, oh my gosh, blood gut in Coke, because they would not have read, you know, they, they read the lawsuit, they hear about the lawsuit, and they never follow up on when the guy was squashed like a bug and said, no, this couldn't happen. So what I did was I was like, no, no, you can't do that. And he was adamant. And fortunately, again, this is where relationship building comes in handy. I bonded with another lawyer who, who was reasonable, and I, he, I explained the logic to him and said, we do not want this to go out. We don't want this to go to court. I know you could take care of this guy. How can you make this go away? So um, I don't know exactly how this other lawyer made it go away. I think it may have had something to do with threatening this guy's lawyer that he would get disbarred because he was uh, proposing a fraudulent lawsuit. Maybe, I don't know this. I truly don't know this, but I wonder if they said, if you, you know, you've got no case here, this guy is, is a fraud. You're going to embarrass yourself. You'll lose your license. And oh, by the way, maybe we can find you some work on the side down the road. I don't know. But end of story is that the idea here was it, the story did not get out. There was not a peep. And it would have only taken one media outlet to hear that and say, ooh, this is a sensational story, blood and coke. And it would have created, you know, a consumer frenzy. Some, you know, you've, you guys have probably studied, remember the needle in the, the Pepsi, cans of Pepsi? Maybe you studied that. Maybe some of you remember, some of you don't in your PR principles classes. But it only takes one sort of product tampering kind of thing to come out and again, consumers go crazy. So keeping a story out of the media can be every bit as important as being responsive and being proactive and getting something into the media. Awesome. Yeah, that's, wow. I feel like a little anxious after hearing some of your stories, but um, no, the, those are incredible examples. And honestly, though each of them are unique, 
probably the common themes we may come up with at some point in our careers. So thank you so much for sharing and your advice. At this time, we've got 12 minutes left. So I have a couple more questions, but I wanna go ahead and open it up to the floor. So if anyone has a question, you are welcome to come up and speak to our speaker. <laughs> don't be shy. <laughs> you want me to go first? I'll go first. Okay. So easy. What's, well, maybe not easy for you. Easy question um, for me to ask, I guess. Um, what is the best piece of advice you could give emerging PR professionals? There's been a lot of advice, but what's the best? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Oh, the best advice. Um, I would say learning what your values are. I, I think on day one, uh, especially in my both my my classes, is uh, focusing on what your values are. Um, your values are going to be your guiding principles in any job that you take, and you never want to. Uh, take a, a role where your values are misaligned or to do something that you're uncomfortable with um, because you're good with people, you're good with relationships. Uh, you don't want to be where um, taken for granted because um, ultimately your your name and your career is on the line. So understanding what you hear about is all those is, is probably the best advice I can give you. Um, and those values will be your compass um, as you move and progress throughout your career. So um, if you don't know what your values are, and they may change as you continue to evolve, but um, allow them to guide you uh, into the right direction. That's incredible advice. Thank you, Professor Thompson. Kristen, what you got? Mine is incredibly similar, but um, kind of develop your personal brand. And that takes time. But as you get going and as you learn what you're good at and what you're not so good at, but you want more practice in, I think really is starting to have that self-awareness in your first year or two. And the things that you do really well, don't be quiet about it. Ask for those opportunities. Merchandise the great results you're getting and the great work you're doing so that within your organization, you become known as the person who does X very well. And then that gives you automatically a seat at more tables over time. Um, and this becomes so much more important, you know, five years down the line and onward, because when managers are building teams, they bring in people who have specific skill sets that they do things really well and you need a diverse team. Um, so it takes time, but like start thinking about that from day one, notice the things that you gravitate toward, that you're great at, and that um, you know that you're great at, and don't be shy about it and just ask for more of those opportunities. And then at the same time, you know, work on the things that you're not as great at because you want to be well-rounded. Um, but day one, like that was some advice that I got um, when I was an intern, I think, and it has held true throughout my entire career. Um, and now as manager myself, like I use that day to day of like, okay, this person's really good at this. So I need one person who's better at being more efficient, but a detail oriented person, but a creative person with big picture thinking. And um, yeah, not that anyone fits into one box, but there are people who have those skill sets and who are just really excellent at those types of work. Um, so yeah, find that out for yourself. And ask your manager, you know, for input on those things and what they've noticed, feedback for you and how you can just continue to grow and develop from there. But um, that would be my biggest piece of advice. Uh, those are, I mean, this is awesome. You guys have gotten some incredible uh, advice and guidance over the last hour. And, and I can't really top all those specific things and I don't want to be repetitive, but so I'm going to come at this again a little differently. And I'm going to say public relations is the most fun job you could have in the world. Have fun with this job. It is serious stuff. We make, you know, the, the blood and the Coke was not a fun, that was not a fun day or nor was the day when I got a call at five in the afternoon from a reporter with the Associated Press said, lady here says she found a thumb in a bottle of Coke. What's your comment? I mean, you have stressful times, you know, and your business is going, but, but bottom line, it is a darn fun job. I mean, I loved it. 
it was fabulous. It was fun because every day I did something different. No two days were alike. You're learning something all the time. You're dealing with interesting products or organizations and people, doing fun stuff, launching things, doing that, having events. I mean, it's still work, right? It's still work. You got to know how to write. That'd be the other thing is be a good writer, guys. Take Pay attention in your writing class. Right, Kristen? You don't, that's what you guys are looking for, right? That's a core skill to have. But at the same time, have fun. It's a fun, it is a fun, fun job. And I think both Chris and Kristen would agree with that. It's fun. Have fun. Work hard, but have fun. Work hard, play hard. Awesome. Thank you. You want to come on up? Hey, Dr. House. Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm in trouble. I'm so inspired by your lecture <laughs> and our guest speaker that I had to come. And oh also, you know, quality time with family because we don't get that enough. Um, <laughs> So my question to um, all of you guys is basically when going into an interview, especially with um, PR, I feel like it's a little bit different than marketing and other jobs that are out in the world. How do we know what to say or what to do to be set apart so that you guys would like to hire us and to work with us? I know that Kristen, you mentioned that you deal with interns. And to me, I'm always thinking, what do they think about me? Like, would they potentially want to hire me? What qualities should I have to show her that I really am a diligent and not only diligent, but passionate person about this career choice? Well, good question. I want to hear what, what Kristen has to say, because she's she's there in the trenches hiring people. <laughs> tell us, tell us all. Yeah. Secrets to getting hired. Hey, it's an amazing question. Um, detail orientedness, you kind of mentioned being diligent, but also showing your passion. That is number one. You would be surprised how many people show up to the interview and say the wrong company name or like reference some type of work that we don't even do. Um, so do your research, number one, but also know that it's it's a conversation. It's not a quiz. Like I'm not you know checking off every single thing that you know. Um, it's more about, so the questions that I would ask if I was interviewing someone as an intern, you know, tell me about a time when you did X or explain to me how you would approach this type of problem. So it's kind of like um, behavioral types of interviews where I'm just like analyzing, again, like your values and like what you've learned in class so far and like what you would bring to that situation. Again, knowing that you're not an expert by any means, but just seeing the way you think about it. Um, but I'm always so impressed when people have done some research. So, you know, if they're interviewing with me and I work at MSL and they know that our company values are leading, learning and loving, and they reference that in the interview and they say, what does that mean, you know, for an employee in your day to day? How does that come to life? Like that shows that when you work for one of my clients, if we end up hiring you, that you're going to do your research and you're going to go into the client call having asked, you know, smart, similar questions like that, too. Um, so I think just being well prepared and well spoken, obviously, but knowing, again, the um, ways that you can merchandise what you do know, while also asking smart questions about the types of things that because you're interviewing us, too. So I also really love when people come and they're like, well, this is the type of work environment that I really want. I want, you know, strong mentorship from the people above me and lots of feedback and just people who pay attention to my work and check ins once a week with my manager. Like, these are all the types of things I'm looking for. Like, can you explain how that would align to an internship with your company? Like, again, being really not shy and asking about, you know, what you want to know and what you're looking for. Um, so it all boils down to just being super well prepared. Um, when I was interviewing back in college, I literally had a spreadsheet of like every company I was interviewing for, what their values were, what their main clients were, you know, any questions I had for them. And I would reference that going into each interview. And that type of approach is like a winning approach, in my opinion. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a different perspective, too, just because I never thought about it as we interview you guys. Um, I feel like a lot of times um, young professionals are always just trying to get the job, not really feel the job. And then it yeah. kind of shows up a little bit later. But thank you. I really like that. Um, but I want to hear from everyone. I want to hear from you, Chris. And then, of course, you, Dr. Howells. You know, Chris. Chris. 
Kristen covered it all. Um, that she well said. Um, if I could add one other thing, I would say is, uh, you know, uh, make sure you you're curious. Um, stay curious, even once you get the job and the job is yours. I'm claiming those those internships and those new jobs for you all as you do it. I'm remain curious there don't let that be the end of your curiosity get to know people build a tribe uh, continue to uh, take your career by the horns because don't wait on your manager or someone your immediate supervisor to make sure you're developing um, that's ultimately your job to make sure you're you're, you're getting what you need um, and again as Christian said speak up be be don't be afraid to speak up if uh, there's something that you need that could help you improving your job and your role um yeah thank you yeah and i would i'll just add a couple of things again trying to be not repeat what you guys have said is practice practice your interviews okay nobody can just walk in and just blah 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 be perfectly coherent and articulate and have all your stories and ducks in a row it takes practice and uh so do as many interviews as you can. Practice. Take advantage of uh, KSU. Take advantage of career services. They will practice with you on interviews. Um, practice with your friends. Practice doing virtual interviews as well as the in-person because it's, hey, most people seem to be getting hired virtually these days. So have that, develop that as well, but get that practice. And then uh, again, you, you can sort of anticipate some questions or at least some kinds of questions. And I guess the more you interview, the more you will, um, you'll get to hear this, some of the questions. And I would say, have little stories in place, the old storytelling. Um, you've all had good experiences that, you know, I've got an internship experience. I've got an experience where I had a struggle with a, with an assignment and this is how I figured out how to do it. Because as, as Chris was saying, these, these situational questions, like, tell me about a time, you know, and then you go, oh boy. So have your, have your little stories, practice them. And so, you know, you're going to have to sort of maybe fit them to one question or another. Don't force it. If it doesn't work, don't say it, of course, but have that. And then there's the old star approach where when you're kind of explaining a situation or they're answering a question, first of all, it's S, what was the situation? What was the task at hand that you had to do? What were you dealing with? What was the action that you took? And then what was the result? And if you can kind of give that complete picture of, okay, this is what happened, this is what we did, and this was the result, uh, again, I think that can help you shape some of the answers to the questions that you'll be asked. But practice. Wow, those are all awesome. Thank you guys so much. And I'll see you in class tomorrow. You better. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, Professor Thompson, I know you have a hard out. We usually do take a picture, so if you could hang tight for just a couple seconds, but it's okay if you can't. Um, so why don't everybody just kind of gather around in front of the screen, if you can, please. Oh, good, we're gonna get to see you all. Yay! <laughs> so I just want you guys to face that back wall, but Tell us the shortest, please. And then Christian, could you take the picture? Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much. And yeah, for the thanks, Chandler, for popping on. Um, for anyone who may be camera off, if you can be camera on, that would be awesome. All right, everybody. All righty. So Christian, you may just want to get a wide view. <laughs> so All fun right. to see everyone. Mm -hmm. I'll stay here. I'll, I'll stay here because I'm on screen. It's fine. Okay. All right, everyone. I feel like you like each other. Christian, the man. Herding cats, y'all. <laughs> y'all know how it goes, right? <laughs> yes, yes. All right. <laughs> okay. No. Give me a countdown. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. If you're staying for the committee orientation, um, please hang tight on this Zoom. But thank you so much, Professor Thompson, Kristen, Dr. Howes. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks thank for you having us. Coming. It was thank great. Thank you so much. This was lovely. Yes. Thank, thank, fun. You. thank you guys. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Hey, Christian. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Good night. Bye.